Uh, greetings, I'm Dr. Stern. I'd like to talk to you today about using sentence length restriction as a tool for teaching writing. Now, <clears throat> before I begin, I would like to tell you a little bit of a story how I came to be at this conference and how I came to be talking about this topic. To tell you the truth, I'm a non-traditional student myself. I'm, I am a native speaker, but I dropped out of college when I was 19. I, I literally hitchhiked out of Austin, Texas with everything I owned stuffed in a duffel bag and a copy of On the Road in my back pocket. I was going to be a writer. For the next 20 years, I wrote and worked construction, and what I learned was nobody wanted to hear what I had to say. Apparently, the world isn't interested in construction workers. So in my early 40s, I decided maybe it was a good idea to go back to college, and I did, and I did quite well as a student. I earned my bachelor's degree at the University of Washington, my master's degree at the University of California at Davis, my PhD at Florida State University. I earned my doctorate in 2008, and it was a bad year to go in the academic market. I had a choice between two jobs. One was teaching at a community college in Bainbridge, Georgia, just down the road from Tallahassee. The other was teaching at the American University of Afghanistan in Kabul. The writer in me, well, that was an easy choice. I went to Kabul. So from Kabul, I went to Bosnia, and I taught there for two years, and then I came to Singapore, then I went to China, and I, I was kind of working my way up the academic ladder, as people do, not that it was anything to brag about, so, but I got an interesting job offer, and that was to go to Phnom Penh, Cambodia, and help found an English-speaking university there. I knew the people who were involved in it. They, they sort of recruited me to come and help, and... <clears throat> It's not a glamorous job. It's not, you know, Stanford or Oxford, or Harvard or Yale or Cambridge, National University of Singapore. It's, it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's Phnom Penh, Cambodia. On the other hand, if you're really interested in writing and language, you're, you know, it's a great field lab. You're out there, you know, you're in the laboratory, brother. It's a good place to do research. So, I was teaching, I was running the writing lab and teaching some lit, some creative writing, some other things. And we had a teacher who was teaching a pre-collegiate level course. This was for students whose English was not good enough to get into the university, but there had been an implied promise made to their families. The students would pay for this course, take this course at the end of the course, they would take an IELTS, TOEFL-like computer exam, and they would pass the exam and then they would get into the university. But there were some very specific limitations in this. They needed to achieve a certain score. It was a do or don't kind of situation. There was no, no room for, for negotiation. At midterm, the teacher teaching that course had a mental health crisis and left, went home. And they asked me to take over the class. What I found was the students had been given four papers. They'd had no feedback. The papers hadn't been graded. Nothing had been done. And really getting to know the students and looking at their work, I realized that we had a serious problem. There was no way that these students were gonna pass this test, none. Worse, I had the, the suspicion that the university wasn't gonna take responsibility for this, that I was gonna be scapegoated. And to tell you the truth, I didn't like that idea at all. Now, one thing you learn working construction, you learn to be a pragmatist, get the job done, whatever it takes. You learn to think outside the box. Now, construction workers might not have great reputations as critical thinking, but I'll tell you something, a lot more critical thinking goes on on job sites than what you might imagine. I certainly wasn't bound by conventions and constraints. My concern was, these kids are gonna pass this exam and nobody's gonna hold me responsible for this debacle. So that weekend, I sat down that first weekend that I had this class, I sat down and I took all of the student papers and I carefully cataloged every mistake in every sentence every one of those students had written. And I compiled a list of the 22 most common mistakes. 
none of this is going to be new or, or unfamiliar to you. You know what they are. Subject, verb, agreement, singular, plural, verb, tense, word form. We know what these things are. I'm asking myself a question. How can I eliminate as many of these mistakes as I can and, and get these kids as quickly as I can to a place where they're going to pass this exam? Well, obviously, if I squeeze, tell students, don't give me a long sentence. I'm going to eliminate conjunctions. I'm going to eliminate verbs in series, words in series, structures in series, and a lot of punctuation problems. I also have had the feeling that it's going to make it easier for students to see and understand things like subject verb agreement, singular plural, things like this. So that's what I did. I told students, you were going to write a paper. Every single class session, you're going to give me a new paper. I'm going to read it give you feedback and the next class session, you'll get it back, give me a new paper. And the one after that, you'll get your revision back and give me another new paper. And we're gonna do that for the next five and a half weeks. That's what we did. But I told students, don't give me a sentence longer than seven words. At the end of this, the students took the exam and every single student, passed the test and was admitted to the university. Every one of them. Not one of these kids would have been close to it at midterm. Now look, this may sound a little odd. I was probably as surprised as, as anyone, but it worked. And the experience kind of haunted me. So a few years later, I was recruited to come and teach at the Chinese University of Hong Kong in Shenzhen. And actually, I ended up taking over the first year writing program, becoming the director of that. And at first, it was small. There were only four or five teachers and, and a couple of hundred, few hundred students. Now we've got 1,600 students and 16 teachers in the program. But that experience in Cambodia haunted me. And I began to experiment with this and adopt it into my classroom. So what I've done is tell my students do not give me a sentence longer than 10 words. Now, I love my students, they're great kids. This is a top tier university in China. They're the top one and 2% of students from all over China. There's some brilliant students, really, really smart kids, but their English language skills can vary wildly. Students from Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou, yeah, they may have better English skills. I won't say they're great, but better. Some of the students from the provinces are virtually illiterate in English. However, English is the medium of instruction for all of their classes. These students study history and art and, and science and technology and everything in English. They have to listen to English lectures, write papers in English, read English textbooks. So we're required to teach reading, writing, listening, and speaking. We have these students, none of whom could get into an English speaking university. At least they couldn't get into freshman composition in an English speaking university. But we have to quickly bring them up to a level where they can function, fully function, in an English language university. It's, it's a tall order, but actually we do a really good job of it. Now, as time went by and we got a little better at this and a little more consistent, a little more organized, we found that it works really, really, really well. I started being curious, why hadn't I run across this in my own studies? Why hadn't I found this when I was a graduate student? Why didn't I read any research about this now? So I started researching the topic. And you know what, what was really surprising was there was almost nothing out there. One of the few articles that I found is entitled Counting Words, Successful Sentences for Beginning ESL Adult Learners Using the Product Approach. It was published in 2017. It's by Suzanne Gardner. Gardner was teaching at the Maryland Correctional Institute at Jessup, Maryland. She describes her students as low literacy, having limited formal education. 
Now she did have the benefit of small classes. There were 12 students. They met for a long time, three hours. And I get the impression, it wasn't real clear in the article, but I get the impression that they met every day. She certainly had the benefit of a captive audience. They weren't cutting class. Anyway, Gardner described her experience like this. If a student can write four words, then he can learn to write six. If he can write six, then he can learn to write eight. As word count increases, fluency improves. Counting words provides methodical and easy access to simple sentence construction. It's not that complicated. It was nice to find out that somebody else was doing the same thing. Gardner says that counting words allowed students to A, become successful writers in a short period of time. B, gain self-confidence as adult learners. C, understand that there are rules that govern language. And D, realize that real communication in a written environment involves using sentences as complete thoughts. Now, another article that I found on this topic was 1977, Thomas C. Cooper, A Strategy for Teaching Writing. Cooper was also interested in this idea of sentences as complete thoughts. Now, he worked on teaching students to write what he called T units, which was exactly one main clause plus whatever subordinate clauses are attached to that main clause. His idea was that writing could be improved by giving students intensive practice in combining groups of kernel, K-E-R-N-E-L, kernel statements to help students that write sentences that were structurally more complex than those they would normally be expected to write. In other words, they would start out with basic units and then add units of thought to that. It was progressive lengthening of their sentences. Cooper proposed a three-step process. I'm not gonna go into that now. You can look it up and read it on your own. But over time, um, his ideas were arranged in a progressive order of difficulty. And that's what we try to do at CUHK. Now in 1992, Margaret Thomas, Gloria Jaffe, Peter J. J. Peter Kincaid, and Yvette Stees published an article called Learning to Use Simplified English, a Preliminary Study. They describe controlled English as devoid of ambiguities, colloquialisms, and synonyms. They encourage the use of active voice, that is subject, verb, object, word order. They want to eliminate verb phrases, and they also limited sentence length, that being 20 words or less. What was really interesting about their paper, though, was they traced their approach to work in the 1930s by a man by the name of C.K. Ogden. Now, as the Industrial Revolution kind of globalized, factory owners, manufacturers began to understand that they could hire foreign workers, good or bad, you make your own judgment about this, but they could hire foreign workers for a lot less than they could pay workers in their own countries. But the problem was language. The workers didn't speak English or German, whatever language it was. And in Ogden's case, he was working with English employers. Ogden devised a simplified vocabulary of three, 4,000 words and taught students to speak simple, controlled length sentences, only a few verb tenses. And what he found was in about six weeks, he could take a group of workers who spoke no English at all and have them functional enough in English to operate equipment, take orders, communicate about problems and function. In, in a basic English speaking environment. Um, this was really interesting. Ogden saw controlled English as a tool to help students grasp basic English skills. And essentially that's what we're doing at CUHK. Now, other articles that outline and support this pedagogy include the Plain English Movement by Jacqueline 
Dorney, 1988, and Improving Written Communication by Graham Smith in 2004. But the most interesting article of all that I found was by Robert J. Connors, published in 2000, entitled The Erasure of the Sentence. Now, what Connors did was Connors traced in detail the history of sentence level writing pedagogy from the 1890s to the writing of his article in the year 2000. Unfortunately, Connors was killed in a motorcycle accident shortly after that. Otherwise, we might not even be having this conversation because he was a big advocate of teaching students how to write simple sentences. Time and again, Connor cited scholars and articles demonstrating that sentence control is essential to good writing. He charts articles about sentence combining from 1960 to 1998 and points out that the number of articles peaked between 1976 and 1985. In that 10 year period, 54 articles were published about sentence length and writing sentences as an important element of teaching pedagogy. Now, from 1986 to 1998, that number went from 54 to only five. Sentence length virtually disappeared. Sentence construction virtually disappeared from the conversation. Connor suggests that the problem was no one doubted that the technique benefited students, but no one could say exactly why it worked. I don't think any of you would even argue with me. When I talk to people about this, most of them say, well, it seems kind of obvious. Connors described it as a practice without a theory, and he attributes its disappearance from discussion to the simple fact that people were more interested in publishing theories, they were more interesting than describing practice. Now, I'm a pragmatist, and I just want my students to learn, learn as quickly and learn as effectively as possible. But this whole idea has just disappeared. I was not exposed to it as a graduate student, nor do I find many people doing it today. When I talk about it to other people, though, they usually look up and go, hmm, that sounds interesting. Now, so what do we do at CUHK? Um, we tell our students, don't give me a sentence longer than 10 words, period. Now, what I'm proposing here, excuse me, what I'm proposing here is first, writing in short sentences forces students to think carefully about every word they write. What words are essential? What words are not essential? Can a single word replace two or more words used? This makes their writing efficient. It helps them develop vocabulary. It helps them work with word forms. Actually, in a sneaky way, it forces use students to use the writing process. They have to read and edit every sentence carefully. Second, Writing in short sentences makes it much easier for students to fix simple grammatical mistakes. For example, student gives me a 27 word sentence. There may be five or six nouns in that sentence, three or four verbs. It's very difficult for the students to see and control the relationships between those nouns and verbs. But in a 10 word sentence, they're generally looking at a subject and an object with a verb in between. It's very easy for them to control that relationship as well as see things like subject verb agreement. Am I using the correct verb tense, singular plural, all of these. It's very easy for them to see and control and fix those kind of mistakes. Third, writing in short sentences forces students to learn new word orders and sentence structures. For example, they may have to replace prepositional phrases with possessive or adjectival forms. And fourth, limiting sentence word count, students can see and express their ideas more clearly. 
it actually makes them better communicators. Yes, translating from one language to another, it's not about transliteration. It's about expressing their thoughts. They begin by simplifying this, expressing each portion of that thought very clearly, very precisely. They quickly find out it's not as complicated as they feared. They become good communicators at a simple, basic level. Now, our goal is not to have them writing short sentences for the rest of their lives. This is part of a process, but it, we feel that it builds their confidence. It helps them learn faster and better. Now, how do we determine this? How do we evaluate whether it works at all? We have kind of a, a, a severe methodology. Our sole criteria is whether the student produces an entirely grammatically correct sentence. Any flaw disqualifies that sentence. Now that's a pretty high standard. We're not counting mistakes. We feel that the number of mistakes is probably limited, but we're not looking at mistakes. I wanna see how many perfect sentences a student can write. So for this research, we're not really looking at paragraph organization or the intellectual merit of what they're saying. In their grades in the course, of course we consider that. But for, for what I've written and for the research I'm doing, no. Now, while it sounds fairly straightforward, there is a tiny bit of ambiguity and, and I don't wanna mislead anyone with it. For example, a student could write a grammatically correct sentence but use the wrong verb tense in the context. In that case, we counted the sentence as flawed because they've used the wrong verb tense, even if the sentence was grammatically correct. Now, all of our students are doing this work by hand. Now we're considering their first week writing assessment with their final exam. All of these are the same. They write in class, they have no computer, no dictionary, no nothing, just a pencil and a book. Now, many Chinese students have this problem with punctuation. It's a little bit different in Chinese from English. They're very careless about periods and commas. So we actually don't count punctuation. There's not much punctuation in a sentence, but between sentences, they don't seem to know whether they're putting a comma or a period. We just separated those as completely separate sentences. We also disregarded fronted adverbial conjunctions. The reason we did that is in Chinese high schools, they tell students, they give them a long mimeograph list of several hundred fronted adverbial conjunctions. They say, memorize this, use it in, you know, throw these at the beginning of your sentences. It will raise your score on the gao cao. The students have no idea what these things mean, what they're doing, what their purpose is. So actually, we don't count fronted adverbial conjunctions either. They're very easy to fix. You tell students don't use them and that problem goes away. All right, so here's what we found when we did this. Now, I'm only looking at a small sample of papers for the purpose of our conversation today, but I took three of the lowest performing students on their first week writing assessment. Student number one for their first week writing assessment wrote 254 words, 17 sentences. The average sentence length was 14.9 words. Of the 17 sentences, none were correct. Every one of them was flawed. Now on this student's final exam, the student also wrote exactly by coincidence 254 words. However, they were divided into 30 sentences. The average length was 8.5 words per sentence, per sentence. 21 of the sentences were perfect. Nine were flawed. That's 70% of their sentences were perfect. That's a pretty high standard to me. Pretty eye popping, frankly. The student earned a B on the final exam. Now, the second paper that we looked at on the first week writing assessment, the student wrote 245 words. 
divided into 14 sentences. The average sentence length was 17.5 words. Um, all 14 sentences were flawed. There was <clears throat> not one single correct sentence. On this student's final exam, they wrote 309 words divided into 42 sentences. The average sentence length was 7.4 words. 24 of the sentences were perfect. 18 of the sentences had a flaw. That's 57% of the sentences were perfect, utterly flawless. And again, I wanna emphasize the total number of mistakes, although we don't catalog those, they were greatly reduced. It wasn't enough to significantly impede the understanding of what the student was saying. Maybe they were missing an article. Maybe they used present tense instead of past tense. You could still understand, easily understand what they were saying. Let me tell you for sure, on the first week writing assessments, sometimes you had no idea what they were saying. The third student on the student's first week writing assessment wrote 184 words, 17 sentences, 10.8 words per sentence. Of these, 15 were flawed, two were correct. On this student's final exam, they wrote 248 words, 29 sentences, the average length was 8.6 words per sentence. 15 were perfect. 14 still had some flaw in them. That's 52%. I might add, however, that the student earned a B plus on their final exam. The thinking and the organization were quite good. And again, what mistakes there were did not impede the understanding of the paper at all. So what does this mean? Given that these essays were written by hand without the use of any dictionary or electronic device, it's safe to say that in the real world, students could have produced even better work. The sample demonstrates dramatic improvement in student writing. The improvement is consistent across the entire freshman class. We just took three of the worst performing students on the first week evaluation as a sample for the purpose of this conversation. Again, we're not arguing that the ultimate goal is to have students write 10 word sentences for the rest of their lives. No, I'm a fiction writer. I write, I understand short sentences, middle length sentences, long flowing, beautiful poetic sentences at the right point for the right reason, but not all the time. All right, finally, <clears throat> we feel that students learn faster, communicate better, it really boosts their confidence. To see a student who can't communicate in English, a few weeks later, they can write something and you can pat them on the back and tell them it's perfect. I understand exactly what you're saying. It's beautiful. Sometimes we have more difficulty with the students who are making A's in their high schools and writing 25, 30 word sentences. They're not correct, but they're still getting A's for them. We have sometimes trouble with, more trouble with the students who have big, beautiful vocabularies than the students who come in at rock bottom. Those students are desperate to do anything to pass. And sometimes they become our best writers. This semester, I had a student who earned an F, essentially, actually <laughs> earned an F on his first paper and earned an A minus on his second. I have another student who earned a D on his first paper and an A on his second paper. The, the progress that these students make is startling. And you know what, if it wasn't, I wouldn't waste my time or yours coming down to even talk about this. In a multicultural, multilingual environment, much like Ogden found in the 1930s, limiting sentence length allows students to more quickly grasp the basic concept of English. It allows them to become better communicators and function better in the community. This is gonna make your jobs easier. It's gonna make them more successful. It's going to benefit their relationships with their classmates, 
their employers, their coworkers, their neighbors, in a multilingual, multicultural environment, having people be able to grasp and perform at a, at a, a relatively competent level in English quickly is really showing respect for people. It's helping them, it's enabling them. One other difference I'd like to point out between what we do and what you might find in New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, UK, US, Canada, wherever you might be. One thing is this, our students, I would describe as L3 students. They're learning English, but they're still in a Chinese speaking environment. They have very limited access to English. In a place like, like Australia, they're going to be immersed in an English speaking environment. They're going to have to speak it at the store, at the clinic, in their other classrooms with most of their classmates. I believe that these students will benefit even more. Like I said, this is a step in a process, not a final goal, but it helps them get their, boost their confidence, make quick, prog quick progress, learn how English works and allows them to become functional very quickly. That's it, very simple. That's all I have to say. So I'm gonna thank you for your time and attention. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can always find me online and contact me by email if you have any questions. And if you're hearing this at the conference, it's only because we had some sort of technical problem and I couldn't be there alive. Otherwise, we'll open it up for q and I've certainly enjoyed chatting with you all. Have a great afternoon.